Okay, I think we'll get started. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this Food Thinkers event tonight. It's fantastic to see such a packed room and so much interest in this really, really important topic of, of lived experience. I'm absolutely delighted to, to welcome Professor Wendy Wills uh, to, to give this talk this evening. My name is Corinna Hawkes, I'm Director of the Centre for Food Policy and the Food Thinkers seminars are held every month uh, or every other month uh, to bring people in who we really feel have made a major contribution to thinking uh, in the field of, of, of food policy. And I would most certainly put uh, uh, Wendy Wills in, the, in that category. She is um, a sociologist, nutritionist, and uh, she's Professor of Food and Public Health at the University of Hertfordshire, and she directs the Centre for Research in Public Health and Community Care. I first came across Wendy's work when I started to read a lot more widely around what was influencing what, what people eat, and particularly around the social, cultural, and economic influences on what people eat, which is what Wendy specializes in. And she has a particular focus on young people, on children, and a particular focus on older people as well. And one of the many things that really fascinated me about her work is the range of methodologies that she uses. The uh, basically qualitative methodologies, but lots of different types including the visual methodologies. And uh, when I, um, at the uh, British Sociological Association uh, meeting where I was uh, talking last year, there was a, and I think you've taken this exhibition elsewhere, that the way that you use these kind of visual methods to, to really try and understand how people, in this case it was older people, actually experienced a, a market environment. Absolutely fascinating, very insightful. And, um, and, and that, it's really changed, I have to say, when it, your work has really changed the way that I view uh, policy. There's a piece of work that you did around school food. And I come from a kind of background of saying, you know, you need to have you know, government do school food policies and um, ban marketing to kids and taxation and all of that kind of thing. It was only really reading really Wendy's work that I really began to get to grips with that how people actually receive these policies and respond to these policies are so fundamental in, t in determining how effective they are and indeed how equitable they are. So thank you for your fantastic work and I'm really looking forward to hearing about it. Wendy gave a talk um, at the City Food Symposium, um, which was held back in April, and today I'm delighted to announce that we have uh, today released the report of that symposium, which you can find online. We will be communicating it much more comprehensively next week, uh, but the, if you go to the Centre for Food Policy website and click on News and Events, and it's, it's right at the top. And what this report does is, is bring together uh, um, all the contributions made to that symposium, including Wendy's work, to try and identify uh, what you'll see written in front of you here on, on this uh, two-pager, which is what we learned from all the speakers at that symposium, which was all about the lived experience of food systems problems, about what the benefits of research, advocacy, and policy that engages with lived experience of food systems problems, not just around health, but all across the board. What are the benefits of it, but what also the challenges of it, and they're significant, and, and Wendy will know that very well. And we came up with a set of principles uh, which we will be using at the Centre for Food Policy to guide our work around engaging with people and engaging with evidence of lived experience, uh, which um, I'd ask you to, to look at and read, which is why we printed it out. I'd love to have feedback, and those of you who are particularly interested in this work do get in touch. Uh, because we do feel that this is critically important to effective and equitable policy. But do take a look at the report and, and the two-pager, which um, is, on, is online. So just to, to, to uh, a few uh, points of, um, of order here, uh, that this is being live-streamed as we speak, just to make you aware of that. And please do uh, tweet if you uh, want to, and uh, there's the, the hashtag there. And uh, there is a, a Wi-Fi password there as well. We are um, going to have a talk for about 40 minutes and then move to questions. We won't be having a microphone um, in, this, um, in this session due to the setup of the room. And uh, the final thing is to, is to make the point about the next Food Thinkers, which will be on December the 5th. We have one of our speakers, Joanna Ralston, is sitting at the back of the room there. We'll be speaking the CEO of the, of the World Obesity Federation along with myself and we're hoping the Secretary of State um, of the um, Ministry of uh, Overseas Development here in the UK. It will be the launch, the UK launch of the Global Nutritional Report of which I am co-chair. 
So that will be a much bigger event. It will be a special event with a reception afterwards and so on. So I hope very much that you come to that and sign up to that. We look forward to seeing you there. With no further ado, um, Wendy, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Karina. Thank you. And thank you. I'm really quite overwhelmed by the interest in this, both from the food symposium earlier this year, which was just, a, you know, my part was only small in that. And I'm really genuinely excited to think that finally, and about time, people are interested in the lived experience of our populations and what we can do with that experience. So, thank you for inviting me. Okay, I'll use that, that's fine. So the image on the screen there, some of you might have seen this if you're on Twitter, but I saw this when it was first tweeted by the European Youth Mental Health um, Group, who thought that Sir Michael Marmot might appreciate seeing this graffitied obesity poster pointing out that poverty, inequality and austerity are also determinants of obesity and no doubt a number of other non-communicable diseases. So thank you to them, because I've stolen it. So obesity, hunger and malnutrition, they're all concomitant issues. All are conditions or states that are influenced to a greater or lesser degree by food and eating. But there are differences, of course. I'm, I'm putting them all together today just to, to drag as many sort of ideas in as possible, really. But there are differences in the way they're perceived, addressed and presented within policy practice, uh, media and lay discourses. And this talk could focus on obesity or hunger or malnutrition without mentioning health or public health. And I'm sure there'll be lots of people happy to point that out. But the conditions of hunger, overweight and malnourishment are important to understand in their own right. And I think it would then be unthinkable if you were really trying to just understand them as they are without thinking about the lived experience. But if you then add in the fact that obesity, hunger, malnutrition, etc., are health-related, either conditions, symptoms, diseases, and they do have implications for health and well-being, then it does become a bit more complex, or a lot more complex. And the physiological, medical, or clinical evidence relating to obesity and malnutrition can be disputed, and there are many people that do dispute it, particularly in relation to obesity, as we know. But the medical and clinical um, community agenda rightly focuses on treatment and management, and so often does ignore the wider determinants of those conditions. That's fine, in my view. But public health, we're in a different position. In, with public health, which is the context that brings together my work and has always been the sort of um, setting for my academic positions, is concerned with the prevention of disease, promotion of good health, and controlling of communicable conditions. And traditionally, public health is based on epidemiology. And whilst that does incorporate, or ought to incorporate, social and other wider determinants of disease, I think it's only more recently, really, that people have really started to consider that more fully. And public health does get sidetracked if you, there's lots online if you, if you look at this, you can get very sidetracked yourself into reading these debates about primary versus secondary prevention. And quite often debates about public health, certainly when it comes to the NHS, are about secondary prevention. How do we prevent people who are already obese from gaining more weight? How do we make sure they can access services that mean they might lose weight and come down to a sort of um, healthy BMI, etc.? So this is my starting point, really, that obesity, hunger, and malnutrition are not only about health and public health, but that the public health context really provides a sort of interesting nexus at which we might consider how to incorporate the lived experience of these conditions so that we can promote uh, quality of life, better health, or well-being. And by lived experience, I'm defining this today as the visceral, embodied, and emotional response to a situation the manifestation of social or economic capital and the effects of the physical environment. There are other things we could add in, I'm sure. So what is the lived experience of a food system or context that on the one hand shows that we have a problem with obesity and childhood obesity in particular and that steps need to be taken to ensure our rates of obesity come down while also showing us that some people don't get enough food and become malnourished or hungry and perhaps needing to rely on food banks. So losing weight is bad for some people and good for others. Cakes are good for you. My favorite picture up there. Cakes can be good for you if you're lucky enough to be malnourished, but perhaps not so good for you if you're not. These are the kind of mixed messages that we're all confronted with all the time. You can shop for food that might be lower in fat or sugar or salt, unless you go to a food bank, and then do you really have any choice? So these are huge challenges that we're facing, and they do challenge us in public health. 
And the public themselves are not always convinced, of course, that anyone in a rich country like ours can be malnourished or hungry. And people talk to me about that all the time, as in Joe Bloggs that I might meet, or my own friends in my own network. And people are too quick to blame parents for their overweight children or not providing a diet that's going to be conducive to a sort of long, healthy and happy life. So food and eating in contemporary Britain is certainly a very challenging, tricky business, and we're at an interesting point in that, I think. So can paying attention to the lived experience of food and eating really help? What can it actually tell us or help us to understand about the realities of being an overweight teenager or the parent of a child that gets a letter home from the National Child Measurement Programme saying your child is obese or overweight? And what can we learn from listening to adults who tell us that they're finding it really difficult to get food even though there are supermarkets and food stores all around the country? So these stories are always interesting, but how can they help us with our public health challenges? So I'm going to outline why I think lived experience is needed as evidence when trying to understand or change food and eating. And I'm going to use quite a lot of different research projects that I've been involved in over the last 10, 20 years really in the UK to really, I hope, illustrate how the social and economic factors inform the way that people eat. Now, on their own, I think these data are endlessly fascinating. Um, as a sociologist, you know, I could read about data and delve into data all day. But I want to go beyond that today and sort of think about why we might use them and how we might use these kind of data um, in order to understand better health, diets, well-being, etc. So experiences of food and eating are socially shaped. Your experience of food and eating will be different to mine depending on your family background and upbringing, your education, your income, your job, uh, the neighbourhoods in which you mix. So social structures and experiences are really important. They matter because they shape how markets respond to so-called consumer demand as well as interacting with other contexts or settings like schools, workplaces, care homes, hospitals, food, the food environment. Social structures both inform and reflect the world around us. And I'm particularly interested in the hierarchical and unequal relation, uh, framework of relationships that arise from the social organisation of labour, education, wealth and income, and particularly in relation to discourses about weight and obesity and feeding children or young people, and more recently in relation to the food secu security among older adults. And it's what the sociologist Diane Ray calls the emotional response to social structures. What does it actually feel like to be a working class child or mother or father living in a socioeconomically deprived neighbourhood when you're obese or overweight or hungry? And how does that compare to someone from the neighbourhood up the road that's not as socioeconomically deprived? If you're 80 years old with limited mobility and no family, how does that feel if you can't afford a taxi from your rural home to the nearest supermarket or the lunch club if you're lucky enough to have one? And how do those structures and experiences shape your response of what to eat and what to do next to change that situation? The social moulding of food practices is embedded and ingrained in our everyday lives and we routinely select what we eat. It's an unspoken, tacit part of our lives most of the time. We have a feel for the game. We kind of know what we're doing. We buy the same food a lot of the time. We have the same routines. So when people still continue to talk about food choice um, and food in terms of behavior change, it's as if we consciously have a blank sheet of paper every day that we get up and decide what we're going to eat. And we don't. It's a mundane aspect of daily routine most of the time. But we're not social dupes. If we were, then the food habits we learn in childhood or at school would be completely set for life. You know, if you're within a particular social group, then the argument would be that you can't do anything about it at all. But we do have agency. And our individual responses and actions are important. But changes to eating habits are never random. There are fields of possibilities for groups of people that are determined by the norms of social groups and dictated by social structures. So the fields of possibilities are still bounded by these social structures, so you can move within the, the circle, but you can't really go outside it. So we have what we call inner conversations. You know, you think, okay, perhaps I'm going to change, change my diet, change what the family eats. You can move a bit, but it's never random and you can't go too far. You don't have complete freedom to do that. 
And in the last few years, when I've not only been researching um, young people's food and eating practices and families and been looking more at older people, I think it's really becoming apparent to me about the accumulation of factors that influence food and eating right across the life course and how they have a profound impact on that, that field of possibilities, what we might or might not change. So the opportunities that people have to take agentic turns to change what or how they eat are still quite limited and bounded. Social structures continue to underpin what we eat at any age. Income and education might dictate wealth or poverty during retirement in terms of pensions or the benefits we might have access to. But inequalities do still exist, and socioeconomic determinants interact with a long list of other factors, and this is what's becoming apparent from our research with older people. There are obviously some significant things like loss of a spouse um, or decline in health that uh, you know, I think all of us would expect would have an impact, but there are a whole range of other seemingly minor issues that we might be able to deal with um, at a different stage of the life course that make it more and more challenging to remain nourished and food secure into later life and that also influence the field of possibilities, depending on where you live and other factors, that mean that people find it very difficult to shore up their own food practices. So this is why food um, lived experience is important, because we do need to understand how these social structures and experiences shape our weight, nutritional status, eating habits, if we're going to develop effective public health strategies or policies um, or deal with things at a local level. And, and the reason I put these pictures on the screen, I've just reminded myself, is also because I think it's become apparent now I'm looking at older people increasingly, just how differently we, and whether that's we as members of the public or in our own families or as academics, public health, whatever your discipline or background might be, treat and view an obese family versus malnourished older people. I'm not saying these older gentlemen are, but... You know, I use this picture from the World Obesity um, Image Bank, so it's a sort of non-stigmatising picture, as in it shows a family who might look overweight, but they are eating salad. They don't only eat burgers and chips. But the way that people are viewed and the sort of compassion, I think, to understand someone's lived experience is really quite different. You wouldn't ever look at a sort of frail old lady who was only eating half a sandwich and say, that's her fault, why doesn't she just go out and buy more food, in a way that people do look at families who are overweight. And that's something that I've only just begun to think about. So I'm going to start drawing on some data now, um, giving you some examples from across different studies. From back in the day when we didn't use visual research methods, I'm not going to talk much specifically about methodology today. I'll make a couple of points, but there are, there's lots to be said on that. So firstly, I'm going to talk about the study we conducted with um, lower socioeconomic and more middle class families. Uh, we interviewed the main food provider, usually the mother, and uh, one of the teenagers in the family, 13, 14 year olds, who were either healthy BMI, obese, um, or, or overweight, to just try and demonstrate the different lived experiences that some of these families had. So I'm using a family called the Watsons and a family called the Connells. So the Watson family, Mr. Watson worked shifts in a manual job and also supplemented the family's income by working as a minicab driver when he had the time. And mum worked at a small local food store working shifts four days on, four days off, really long hours. They lived in a social housing scheme with their two adolescent children and we know from Lorraine's BMI, which we measured, she was obese, and Mrs. Watson was also considered herself to be overweight. And the Watsons had food routines that sort of focus on ensuring that everyone got fed so that life could continue every day. There was always plenty of food in the freezer throughout the month. 13-year-old Lorraine was encouraged to prepare food for herself and her younger brother after school because mum was at work on the days she worked and they needed to, to eat. Mrs. Watson often did cook, batch cook sort of food when she did have a day off so that everyone could just reheat it and life could go on. On a Saturday, Lorraine talked um, and explained to me what she meant by a baker's lunch on a Saturday when they had filled rolls or pies and cakes from the local bakers, which meant everyone could sort of get on with chores, homework, all the things that needed doing on a Saturday, but they could still eat together. And this family had food practices, really, that we summed up, enabled them to function and get by. Whereas in the Connells, so Mr. Connell was an engineer and mum was a solicitor. They had a large detached house, two adolescent children, and none of them um, were overweight or obese. 
And the Connells reported eating as a family was the norm for them, and they prioritised this over most other things. So the children were not, absolutely not allowed to get food themselves, they weren't allowed to prepare food for themselves, they had to eat when the parents decided they were going to eat, they couldn't take snacks from the kitchen without asking. And Mrs Connell was really focused on ensuring that her children grew up eating what she called a cosmopolitan diet, avoiding the sort of traditional meat and two veg type foods she, she remembered uh, not very positively from her childhood. And health and healthy eating were prioritised as something that would improve the, the whole family's lives, really. But also it was something that to get very anxious over not doing well enough at. And temporality was a really important aspect or element to emerge from all the lived experiences of families in these studies. The Watsons focused on the here and now, getting by, enabling life to flow as smoothly as they could make it. Whereas the Connells were firmly focused on the future. They wanted their children to develop social capital. They proudly spoke about their daughter's um, ability to eat in a nice restaurant without embarrassing them, whether they were there or not. They wanted their children to eat vegetables, so they put a lot of emphasis on that, as you can see from the quote on the screen. And the daughter, Elspeth, reported to us um, when we interviewed on her own, her own guilt and anxiety that she could never quite do well enough at eating in the way that her mother in particular wanted her to. And in the Watson household, the autonomy of the children was really important. It was very much a marker of success. The children could feed themselves. Uh, Lorraine used to help out doing the laundry at the weekend for pocket money. They could cook for each other and they weren't fussy. They ate what food was there. Whereas in the Connells, they reported very different markers of success. Not having fussy eaters in this family was more related to children eating the foods that were good for them when they were told to, like the fruit and vegetables, and being willing to really cut down on the sort of um, snacks and sugary drinks, that kind of thing. And I do wonder, and I would be interested to know, you can tell me at the end, I wonder how many people in the audience think, if only we could get the Watsons to be more like the Connells, if only we could get Mrs Watson to tackle her daughter's obesity through making sure they couldn't take snacks whenever they wanted, Lorraine wasn't given free reign in the kitchen to make whatever she wanted for her and her brother's tea when the parents weren't there. If only they would eat more fruit and vegetables. But the lived experiences of these families in, illustrated in these studies, what we call when we wrote um, papers on this, the hierarchies of worry in terms of food habits. So when life is stable, when you've got a good income and you're not too worried about the security of your job, you can really think about your family's eating habits and make sure and prioritise whether they're eating fruit and vegetables or eating breakfast, etc. And you can prioritise long-term health. When life is less certain and when you're worrying like the Watsons were about whether they would have jobs or enough jobs and a high enough income to mean that they could get through the month, when you were worried, not in the Watsons case, but more generally about your marriage breaking down, your daughter mixing with the wrong crowd or not coming home on time after school, then shaping the family eating habits just becomes further down the list of priorities. The worries are different. It doesn't mean that the Watsons didn't care about their health or about their daughter's or Mrs. Watson's obesity, but it just meant that trying to change food practices is incredibly difficult because the family were operating in a system that was influenced by these socio-economic and structural constraints. And the social milieu in which the Watsons live compounds these feelings of success and achievement about getting by and this having the feel for the game. They thought they were doing well. You know, the family were getting by. Children were happy. There was no impetus to change. And that's the power, I think, of trying to explore the lived experience and really understand it and value it and not just see it as a nice story to add on. And it highlights why behaviour doesn't shift easily. It raises questions also about the extent to what, to what extent can we expect families to actually change their own eating habits. You know, to download the sort of Change for Life sugar app. You do it. It's about what you choose in the supermarket rather than seeing it as part of a much wider system. And I'm going to turn now to our research in schools. And young people, as everybody here knows, uh, from socioeconomically deprived backgrounds tend to have a poorer diet, higher rates of obesity, and yet the evidence isn't really clear about exactly why that is. And if you do visit the many schools um, and look at the examples that people regularly send me to say, look how well these schools are doing in terms of the food environment and food provision, you might also think, actually, I, I'm not sure how schools might be contributing. But if you go to the schools that I often go to as part of our research, and we don't have to look very hard to find these, it's not that we particularly find schools that are not very nice, then I think the difficulties are right in front of you. 
The food and drink available to purchase during the school day and the environment in which it's sold is not a socioeconomically neutral issue. And it's really interesting um, and distressing, I think, in equal measure to hear young people about the injustice and inequality that they feel that their families face because they're poor but not poor enough to get free school meals, whereas some of their friends can. To hear teenagers say that they just don't feel welcome or safe in their own school. To not feel comfortable eating in their school as a place that's for them. And that the food and drink that they're sold at school is poor value, unaffordable, unaffordable and low quality. Whereas when they shop on the high street, they're welcomed. The shopkeeper knows what they want. They've known them for a long time. They can purchase food at low cost in an environment that suits their needs. And we've always found in our research with schools and about food at lunchtime that young people do not want to eat a meal at lunchtime. They want to eat just enough food that fills them up at as low a cost as possible if they're paying for it themselves so that they can save some money. And they want to hang out with their friends. And in schools where young people can go outside or do go outside at lunchtime, and in Scotland we found this um, a lot more than in, in research in England, we found that up to 90% of young people at the most socioeconomically deprived schools were going out of lunch a couple of times a week. So it's no wonder that a bag of chips is an attractive option if you really feel that school is somewhere you need to escape from at lunchtime because it's unwelcoming and you can only buy those chips if they're part of a meal that you don't want to eat the rest of and waste your money on. These are two of our GIS maps from, from the, the project in Scotland. The, the bigger pink dot in the middle are the schools. Um, the darker blue are the most um, deprived quintiles in terms of um, indicates of multiple deprivation and the lighter blue it's, it's less deprived. But both of these schools have the same number of food outlets within an 800 meter radius, a 10 minute walk. So they have between 20 and 99 food outlets. Both had a higher than average percentage of pupils eligible for free, uh, yes, eligible for free school meals. But one of the schools People, young people were much more likely to go out more regularly than at the other school. At the school on the left, young people were much more likely to leave school at lunchtime to go to takeaway outlets, and at the school on the right, they were more likely to leave and go to supermarkets to buy something. Both schools had a similar number of takeaways and supermarkets. The school on the left had much higher levels of multiple deprivation, and yet it was the pupils from the school on the right who said that price was the driving factor in their purchasing decisions. The school on the left, young people had really good relationships with retailers uh, and yet really didn't feel welcome at school. Whereas at the school on the right, I mean, you can so it's quite stark that the, the right-hand side of the catchment area was actually quite affluent and the side on the left wasn't. It meant there was a real mixture of food outlets and young people often really didn't, I mean, it was almost like a divide. You know, you, you could still walk two minutes and go to one of the shops on the right where they sold fruit and vegetables and actually you wanted to buy a punnet of raspberries to go with your lunch, but they didn't feel welcome there. A sort of invisible barrier of this kind of other, othering of socioeconomic status that this wasn't for you. So even though the food was there, it was like peering in from the outside. So the lived experience of going to a school in areas that are socioeconomically deprived or not is very nuanced. Price, type of food outlets, social interactions, they all differentially influence the lived experience of shopping and eating food um, at lunchtime. So I'm going to show you um, our film, hopefully, yeah. Um, this that we made after the end of this project and our intention was to go back to one of the schools in Scotland and ask young people to sort of act out our findings so that we could make a film and make it more accessible. When we told young people about our findings they got very animated because they had exactly the same feelings about food as the young people that were in, you know, we had 600 young people in the research. This one class or a small group of 10, 12 as you'll see, chatter away while we're talking to them and they're eating lots of fruit that we brought in for them because they said they only got rubbish fruit at school. So the audio quality is not always brilliant on here. We'll see how it plays. And they have very strong Scottish dialects. But you can close your ears and open your eyes and just see and see what it's like for these young people and why they might be going outside to school when they do. And why, if you were these young people, what would you do? You know, how would your food choices um, be influenced? It's five minutes. So this research was about asking young people what they want to do with food and drink around schools and within schools. And it's young people's voices we really want to come across from the research and through this film. 
because they're the people that consume the food either in school or outside school, so why not ask them what they want? <laughs> so who do you want to say this film and hear what you've got to say? So do you think people should listen to young people? They make us feel irrelevant. We need more space to eat our lunch. I feel that we're respected more when we go out to the shops by the shopkeepers. Sometimes it's not that we like want to go out, like sometimes it'll be raining, but sometimes it's that we need to go out. That can be quite intimidating. I think our school should maybe ask us what we'd like for lunch, so then we're not spending money on stuff that like, we don't really like. I mean, using the school cafeteria should have a bigger variety to choose from. They're, they're not always what we want to eat in there because they're not the best of foods and they've not, not got a good selection to choose from. By the school you can get like rolls or a you little know, chip or the Chinese. When you go out of school at lunchtime it's much more fun rather than going inside because when you go out like you can have a laugh and you don't feel like there's teachers or people watching you really, like over your shoulder, like watching your every move, like you've got a bit of freedom rather than just sitting inside and being like only allowed in certain areas and if you go up there that's it, you're in trouble, you're in detention, it's lunch or whatever. At the cafeteria they kick you out once you've eaten so it's not really a social place or anything. They kick you out but you've got nowhere to go for like 10 minutes till the bell goes. There's not really anywhere to eat if you do eat in the cafe because the tables are always messy from the before and there's like benches but they're just covering chewing gum and like bird food and things. We're giving the money to school so surely we should be getting what we want rather than what they what, what's easiest for them to make. Like you would probably be a lot healthier at places for healthy things for more mm. as you can get like tips for your sex events. It's nice staying in school if we had to see what was in our, the menu um, because then we feel like we can have that food and be happy with that food. It's also cheaper because like, they have special menus or they put prices down like in Chinese or Chippy. When you go outside uh, of school for your lunch, you, know, you just feel like you can be yourself and, and just enjoy yourself more. Okay, so I'm going to move on now to talk about lived experiences um, of food security and insecurity, malnutrition, hunger in later life. 
So food security exists when individuals and populations have physical, social and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs in a socially acceptable way for an active and healthy life. And we estimate that about one in ten older people are malnourished because they aren't accessing or eating sufficient food or nutritious food to maintain good health and well-being. Losing weight is not a natural part of getting older. And the recent um, launch of the UK's first Malnutrition Awareness Week, that was a key headline of the campaign to try and demonstrate that if you notice an older relative or someone you work with, you know, as a carer, etc., is losing weight, that we need to take action. And our research with older people has shown that there are three key areas that seem to influence food insecurity and malnutrition in later life. Social networks, the food landscape, and physical and mental capacity, and the changes to those things as people get older. And it's evident from all the research we conduct, really, not just on, on older people, that social interactions and encounters are absolutely essential in relation to the way that people eat and access food. So in later life, eating alone can be experienced as an incredibly isolating experience, particularly when the other two factors on the screen interact with loneliness and isolation. So when staff in shops don't make eye contact when you're having your one day out a week to get food, when bus routes are terminated, when your eyesight's failing or your mobility starts to deteriorate. Fleeting social encounters are better than no social encounters. And in fact, we are now wondering whether fleeting social encounters bring the same benefits as more established and deeper family or peer relationships. So that conversation with the milkman or with the person that brings meals on wheels, a bit of chat with the friendly taxi driver or the lady on the till that rings up your shopping every week can be absolutely crucial to enhancing food security, health and well-being for people that are otherwise isolated and may not even realise that. And there's a tipping point, we think, when poor social networks, lack of access to food from services and retailers and accumulation of physical or mental health issues lead an older person in particular to be particularly vulnerable to, food, to hunger and malnutrition. They start to lose weight and no one notices. Their wedding ring falls off because of how much weight they lost and they just think that's a little bit strange or that their hands are cold. They read public health messages about maintaining a healthy weight and avoiding fat and sugar and think, well, I'm doing pretty well really, I'm not overweight and I do really try to avoid um, fat and sugar in what I eat. And then illness strikes, and it's much harder for people to recover when they're malnourished and they don't have the strength to do so, and then things cause spiral out of control. And social structures do continue to underpin these lived experiences, not just obvious things like income and poverty, but living in a poorer area, for example, where no one's really got any fight left in them to fight for the last remaining bus service or the one lo local lunch club that some local ladies run once a week at the church or where local shops are inaccessible unless you could have a, still have a car, and where food markets in some of the smaller towns that we've done research in are really aimed at sort of wealthier foodie types, not older people wanting to buy one potato or a tin of soup so that they have something to eat that day. And when their health starts to deteriorate, they literally don't know who to turn to or who to phone to get assistance. So I'm going to show you another film now to illustrate this. This one's three minutes to try and bring some of those factors together and show you the sort of experiences, the lived experience of shopping for food. These are all in supermarkets, but you can see some of those factors and what happens. Right, off, 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 and I away. Let's go. Great photo goes through there. All right. Not before the sun's come out, there'll be a rainbow somewhere in here. These are the ones. And he's got to the sun. Oh, they're lovely, aren't they? These were looking in the road because that pavement starts. 
I can't cope with it. Polly, it's no great. Let's go ahead, you have to Oh, is it really? Just there, near those three spots. My eyes. There he is, your eyes. Lots of the things you want seem to be quite high up. They are. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's hard work, isn't it? It is. <laughs> you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Very yeah. Okay, thank you. Hello. Yes, thank you, love. Hello, love. This is my new girlfriend. Is everything all right? Oh, not too bad. Now, would you like two or one? I'll have two. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. This is what they call service. <laughs> very good service. Very good. Right, enjoy your meal. <laughs> right, here we go. I was going to say quite a bit about social practices, but I'm going to skip over some of this because I really want to get to the, the public health part, but I'll just say a few things about this because I do want to sort of provide a framework within which we might think about um, uh, the lived experience. So whether you're an academic or a policymaker or a student or a dietitian or a nurse or an occupational um, therapist, etc., I think practices frameworks can be useful for any of us to just think about food within a broader system and context. Um, and how the lived experience of behaviour might fit within that. So there are three elements that encompass a practice. The people who shape um, or perform the practice, the available resources that might inform it, and the meaning given to the practice. So Reckwitz has defined practices as a routinized type of behaviour which consists of several elements interconnected to one another. Forms of bodily activities, forms of mental activities, things, their use, a background knowledge in the form of understanding, know-how, emotions, and motivational knowledge. And practices are entangled and relational. In one of our um, reports that we, when we were looking at domestic kitchen practices, a different study, we tried to document what was involved in actually cooking dinner, in inverted commas, from the moment that somebody said, I'm going to make the lasagna now, and wash their hands, because they said they always did, through to sort of it going into the oven. And it encompassed so many entangled things within the food practice, including petting the dog, feeding the dog, answering the phone, looking up a recipe on an iPad, uh, defrosting some food, some fruit from the freezer to make a dessert, seeing to the children in the other room, pulling up the bin liner on the bin because it started to fall inside, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, the food practice or the cooking can't be unentangled from all these other things. So I think it's really useful, hence the jigsaw puzzle on the screen, to think of this in terms of a jigsaw. One of those elements is you doing your shopping or eating your meal, but all those other elements, the values and beliefs that you've brought with you throughout your life, um, income, resources, whether you, what cooking facilities you might have, what access do you have to food stores, whether you have a car, whether you drive to the shops, etc., etc., are all the other parts of a much bigger jigsaw puzzle. And I think when you think about um, what we eat as part of a jigsaw like this, it, it suddenly becomes, I think, madness to think, well, if we just change one bit, if we just get that person to see that actually they need to shift their, their own eating habits a bit, then you can see that the whole puzzle needs to change, like a Rubik's Cube. I'm starting to think actually might be a better um, thing that I might use. So you've got to do all the twisting and make every, get all your ducks in a row, as it were, not just change this one element without considering all the other bits around it. 
And all the parts of the jigsaw puzzle, all the parts of our food and eating practices are dynamic. They move subtly over time, depending on what we've got going on. And there might be a big change. You know, the introduction of universal credit has a huge impact on what people can afford to eat if they're in receipt or not in receipt of that benefit. Down to some smaller changes, you know, the, a local food shop no longer having an offer on the type of food you like to buy or the bus route changing so that you have to go to a different supermarket. So depending on the scale of the change, and also the point of the life course when it might occur. Because we think there are particular points of leverage, for example, pregnancy, being diagnosed with diabetes or, or a heart condition um, or dementia. There could be particular tipping points where you or the people caring for you are more likely to think, okay, we're gonna have to shift what we do. But there are also all those in-between times when things are dynamic and just shifting a little bit all the time. So practice frameworks, I think, are useful to consider complex events, which are food and eating. They might be mundane, but they're still complex. To weigh up the influence of our own personal agency or our behavior alongside all the social structures and the economic, historical, cultural, political context that have relevance, because they can't be ignored either. We shouldn't decontextualize behavior, the bit that, where we do or where we eat, from all these other contexts. So the public can only really eat well within a system that gives them a, fi a fair environment to do so. There's no point just thinking about behavior or top-down approaches where you're just trying to shift that one bit. So I've raced through that bit. Um, so moving on to think about public health. Um, there's a lot that I could say here. I could spend the next hour talking about things, points of learning, I think, for public health policy and practice. So I'm gonna keep it to four main points in a minute. And I'm drawing inspiration from two of our fabulous directors of public health, Jim McManus in Hertfordshire, where I work, and Greg Fell from Sheffield, both of whom have excellent blogs that I recommend you go and read if you're interested in this stuff. And Andy Turner, who's a public health specialty registrar in uh, Cumbria and Lancashire, and he's been writing recently on Greg Fell's blog page. He's a kind of newbie on the block. He's got some really great ideas, I think. Um, I'll put their Twitter what sits there so that you can find them. And I think actually if you go onto the Public Health England website, you can find all the local directors of public health throughout the country. And actually, I think a lot of directors of public health, they have the answers. They know what needs to be done and they do understand the power of the lived experience and how we can't just shift one element or have uh, downstream policies all the time. But they are as constrained and frustrated as I often feel by dwindling public health budgets lack of commitment by central government to the prevention agenda, even though it's a really central tenet of the NHS forward plan, and STPs are stating that prevention must be prioritized at local level. There's no meat on those bones. So my four points, avoid lifestyle drift. I think it's very easy to go away from something like today or to consider this and think, yeah, this is, this is fantastic. We really do need to think about this whole system and all the different elements that work but then to think, but actually, should we just do something and why isn't that focusing on the individual or local uh, groups or populations, for example, and we drift back to thinking, well, lifestyle's the easy bit. We will design an intervention, and there are some really good interventions around that might try and shift um, uh, people's behavior, but it's this drifting back all the time to this one part of the jigsaw puzzle that I think is very dangerous. It leads to us blaming people for not taking responsibility for their, their health or their food or their well-being. And when I talked about the Watson family earlier, I said the easy response would be to think, you know, how can Mrs. Watson or, and Mr. Watson uh, provide better food for their family? It's a lifestyle drift response. And even within uh, many policy documents, I mean, and I know a lot of policy documents are all encompassing, so they don't only focus on this. I've just taken this one from um, chapter one of the Childhood Obesity Plan under the section on harnessing the best technology. You know, we need accessible, simple information on how much sugar, fat, and salt your weekly shopping contains. We need apps that enable consumers to make the best use of technology and data to inform eating decisions. The language around it is never contextualized to think that this is just one element of what we need to do. So my second point, don't ignore the social sciences. Um, the report that was out last week, uh, or the week before, from long awaited from Public Health England on applying behavioral and social sciences is worth a read. Um, and Jim McManus has just written a blog about this. He was um, on the working group that helped develop it. Because I think this does give us a document that we can hold people to account over in terms of acknowledging, or more than acknowledging, realizing we really have to work with behavioral and social science 
sciences and scientists. And if you're working in, say, nursing or dietetics or nutrition, and you don't know any social scientists, go and make some new friends would be my advice, because I think it really does help when we work in multidisciplinary ways. One of the aims of this report is to strengthen transdisciplinary approaches to deliver effective and efficient change. And I think that is a very, very grand ambition. You know, not only multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary, but transdisciplinary, you know, is the, would be the, the, the cherry on the cake, as it were. We're a long way from that, although it's a, um, it's a worthy ambition to have. And I was thinking this morning, as I was thinking about this part, that many of the PhD students that I supervise are nurses, dietitians, nutritionists, there's one junior doctor, and they all come thinking, oh, I've got a bit of an interest in socio-cultural aspects of something to do with food or eating, and it'll kind of fit nicely with what I already know about how people eat. And then they do, the good ones, and most of them are, I have to say, thankfully, really do realize you've got to completely unpack and unpick that, that whole way of thinking, you know, because I, I feel sorry for them, really. But I do really unpack their writing, saying, well, obviously, physical activity is good for people. Obviously, increasing fruit and vegetables is what we need. To, well, why? Why is that the right thing? And for whom? And who is saying so? And I think it really does help when we all work together on this. Other recommendations in this report are about increasing the number of programs, policies, and interventions that align with behavioral and social science principles, encouraging behavioral and social science research funding. Yes, please, that would be great. Strengthening communities of practice that understand behavioral and social sciences. And again, you know, whichever area you're working, I mean, our director of public health, Jim McManus, He's really into all of this. I've given a whole talk um, at the local authority public health conference on practices, you know, for a whole hour or whatever, because they're really interested in, okay, well, how are we going to do this? Not just saying, oh, yeah, it looks good on a piece of paper. And I haven't said much about methodology today, but uh, Corinna referred at the beginning to the range of, you know, methods and methodologies that we use. And again, you're not going to get at lived experience through a survey. You know, you've really got to, again, work with people that understand different methods. So in order to develop communities of practice, my third point, we've got to involve people that have the lived experience of obesity, malnutrition, hunger, whatever, in our public health processes. We've got to involve people in the commissioning of programs and services, developing policies, designing research, evaluating interventions and conducting interventions. And we have a really strong tradition in this country in terms of health research, in terms of patient and public involvement, PPI. But it, or you might call it citizens' panels, you might call it something different depending on the background that you're from, but it's still not universally acknowledged that we need people with the experience of situation A or condition B to help us find solutions to it, which I still find absolutely extraordinary. And why don't people do it automatically or believe in it? Well, it's messy, really, involving people, and it is. And you have to get used to the fact that when you have lay members on uh, advisory groups or panels helping to design new policies, interventions, school dining invites, etc. They say all the things that the rest of us are too polite to, to say because they don't have those barriers. They're not there in a professional capacity like we might be or many of us are. So they really tell it like it is and they hold you to account over it. And if you don't get back to them to say what you've done, they want to know why you haven't. And I get, I get approached at our university all the time by some of our lay members who say, you never did tell us what you did with X, so we've, we try to get better at that. So it's messy, it's time consuming, it's expensive. Is it just a nice to have? I would argue it absolutely isn't. It's fundamentally important that we involve communities in designing neighborhoods, workplaces, services, policies, uh, food systems um, that can improve primary or secondary prevention in terms of malnutrition, obesity, etc. And I think any system that doesn't do this is flawed and really shouldn't be publicly funded. I mean, I do feel really strongly about this, that we have to hold people to account. You know, and I do, I work in a couple of teams, not at our university, I have to say, elsewhere where they say, oh, we have tried to get some lay people involved, but we just haven't been able to, let's move on. And I think, no, let's not, because, you know, how do we know about this condition that people have without having them involved in shaping our research and then what we do with it? So I think we have to embolden those who make policies at national or local level to have confidence in lived experience. And that's, that's our job, that's my job. I think we have to do this, including really making better use of research that's qualitative rather than a large national survey. I mean, even when we involved 600 young people in our research in schools on food and the policy stakeholders were really taken with it, they thought it was fantastic, but they still kept referring to the survey that we did where we actually had fewer than 600 people take part 
you know, but we have to keep repeatedly talking about why this is important. And I think any um, policy or evaluation of interventions that doesn't build in sufficient time and funding to enable to do this properly, again, we need to call it out. Um, and we had an example, this was a year or so ago, where a local authority, not where I work, had spent three years designing a really, really fabulous joined up intervention to work with children at primary school age. They really had involved stakeholders from you name it, they had them involved. And so they wanted a very grounded evaluation of how this was going to work. And I helped them write the tender document and everything for it. And then they completely slashed the budget and said, actually, we've decided we can't afford that bit. We'll just do a few interviews and a survey to find out how, whether people made any, whether it made any difference. And I think it's not right that that should happen anymore. My fourth point, we need better arguments, not better evidence. And I've taken this directly from Andy Turner's recent blog on Greg Fell's um, blog site, because I, th I thought it was a good one. Because we can never have really incontrovertible evidence that an approach is guaranteed to work or not work. So we have to go with the probability of something working. It's not that we need better evidence. We just need to get better at putting our arguments forward, drawing on lived experience. Because people who work within public health or might design um, policies or local intervention, they have their own lived experience as an individual. You know, they're not just working in public health. So we need to help people see the difference that lived experience is going to make. And I think as academics, I mean, I've certainly been learning this over the last few years, you know, we don't always like to state boldly what our findings might say because, you know, we're used to writing academic papers and things where we would never overstate you know, what we might have found. But actually, I think sometimes we're not doing ourselves any favors. We have to say things very boldly. You know, we have to say, if we don't ensure older people have access to social support, they will be malnourished and they will go hungry and they will end up in hospital and then it will be harder for them to go back and live in the community. You know, that's not overstating it. It's just using language that's a bit different to what we might use in other fora. So we have to get over our reticence. So we have to use lived experience in a way that can't be um, ignored and we do need to do it repeatedly. And we need to walk in others' shoes, not just through lived experience, but I mean people who say, no, it is parents' fault when their children are overweight. Um, or why does that family not visit their, uh, their older relatives living in sheltered housing? It's their fault that they don't have food. This is not ignorant, it's a different view. And again, we need to work across these different perspectives and views so that we can all try and work together. And I think we have to create a sort of um, a movement of anger almost that actually we can't ignore everybody's experience when it comes to, to food and eating, particularly where inequalities continue to exist. And I've put a picture on the screen there um, of a, a game that we've just developed, and I'll have some leaflets if anybody wants one. Um, this is a new departure for us. And again, I think this does have the potential to really help different stakeholders think about the lived experience and what they can do about it. So it was based on our research findings of food in later life, um, then focus groups with stakeholders from public health, the third sector, the commercial and retail sector, pilot testing with dietitians and other students. And it forces people to think through different scenarios. You probably can't quite read that on the screen. So they go around the board and they get given a scenario and ask, well, what do you think the person could do? And it gets people to realize just how complex it is. So for example, I was playing the game with our locally elected uh, cabinet member in, in Hertfordshire recently. And one of the questions was uh, something to do with sort of ready meals and whether we should make it easier for older people to access ready prepared food so that they can have something to eat. And he immediately said, well, no, because they're nutritionally inferior. Surely that's not the route we want to go down. And I said, well, but if it means that they get to walk to the shops once a week to buy some of these ready meals and have that social interaction and get some physical activity and remain active, and it means they have a hot meal rather than a sandwich three times a day, which many older people do eat, or cereal, is that not better? And so then we had a whole debate about actually, okay, maybe that is better in some circumstances. And when would it be appropriate that this person... Uh, this fiction, well they're fictional but they are based on our research participants, moved on to having meals on wheels so it was delivered but then, then also not going out to the shops. So it's just thinking through all those different elements. So I'm going to close in a minute and say I hope that I've convinced you that lived experience is not a nice thing to do or tokenistic, it's something that's absolutely essential if we want to understand how to improve population health and start to address 
obesity, hunger and malnutrition and other such issues that relate to our food system here in the UK. Thank you very much. always been very, it's particularly with the work on older people, that we don't predetermine who's vulnerable, and that's a big discussion that we've had. Uh, the Food Standards Agency co-funded that work with the ESRC, and we had a big discussion with them about we're not deciding that every, everyone over 65 is, is vulnerable. We want to do the research and work out, and vulnerable to what, you know, is, is, is the other issue. So, and we are still debating that. We've got this whole model that we're trying to develop in terms of looking at the different factors that might influence when someone becomes vulnerable. Because it is so dynamic, I think that's the issue. This issue about practices, things change. So where something catastrophic can happen, if somebody's hospitalized, for example, then they do become vulnerable when they come back out, especially if they're living on their own. That's the point when they might need more intervention, but it might only be for a short period. So I think, it, again, it's trying to work with vulnerability, but in a sort of complex framework
start, and I think we do have to work with people and sort of, you know, in order to give them um, options and get them to think, okay, none of those things are going to work for us. We're going to have to do it differently where we live or in our area to work how they can get the right people on board listening. Because again, if I come back to you know some of the great people working in public health, you know they do listen. Uh, they need a way of accessing those voices, and we need to make sure that those things are joined up. I think again, not always easy to do, easier in some places than others, and not assuming that there's a right way of doing it. You know, that, and, and trying different things until we find forums and vehicles enabling those voices to be heard and to make sure again it's consistent and it's not just done as a as a one-off that's done once a year you know and then people still feel well no action was taken so what was the point of that and that's what we found with young people in schools that they're so rarely in some schools some schools do it really well how they consult with young people but in some schools they're, they're not asked or it's the same group of young people the ones that are involved in um, you know, school nutrition action groups and things who are the most vocal but what about all the others they do have a voice it's just we haven't tapped into it in the right way It wasn't just one school, but um, uh, no, that's a very good question, actually. No, I didn't think they did. That's <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. I would quite like to follow up with those, actually, to see how things have changed over, because it was even simple things. I mean, you saw on the film, which was trying to document what we found regularly, you know, machines that people put their money in so that they had a card so that they weren't paying at the point of purchase, but it was such an issue about the machine not working. That's why it's shown on the film the money coming back out and then they'd get there and they didn't know how much was on their card and felt very embarrassed to ask how much something was going to cost if the price wasn't visible and then feeling that you've got to go to the back of the queue or your friend had to lend you some money. Uh, all those kind of things. We did try to get the schools to really sort of think a bit more about saying, surely you can change some of those obvious things. And I had some meetings with um, head teachers and, and many local education authority um, people where they would say, you know, tell us what you think should happen. And I would say, some of it's really simple stuff. But I've been saying for a very long time, you know, don't have broken tables and chairs. You know, have jugs of water that haven't been sitting there and they've got all bits of food in that people have thrown. You know, make the eating environment nice and nicer and welcoming in a way that lots of young people can access. Because some schools did it by, um, not because of, of our research, but they'd created some nice, you know, sort of comfy seating areas where young people could buy a sandwich and, and a drink or whatever, but it would seat six people, you know, and the other 300 of them are thinking, well, well, I'll just go sit on the floor or the stairs, which you saw in the film that people were doing. So it's, you know, and it's not easy in schools, obviously, but I still think that there is more that we can do to sort of, yeah. And how you, uh, we've also found that there's, so, it's so important, the relationship between the head teacher chair of governors sometimes and the head of catering or the, the, the catering contractor um, in the school as to how, how they, whether they all feel on the same page with what they're trying to achieve it does make a big difference as to what action happens. No, I think that's a really good point, and it comes back to the point I just made about schools and school nutrition action groups. You know, if you're only listening to a certain voice, um, then there is a danger, I think, that you can sort of think, oh, well, that must apply to everybody here, and we'll do whatever they say. So again, I think it is about 
and that's Sharon's point, of finding the different groups and ensuring different groups can engage and that it's a wide enough spectrum of people from whatever community that you're trying to work in or with. So although you're not going to capture every voice, um, because that would be impossible, more than likely, but I think if you do have a broad spectrum and you don't alienate people through the methods that you're using, whether, whether it's the book, but whether it's you know direct sort of policy making and, and, and gathering evidence from local communities, then I think that still should be a strong enough voice that you've done your best effort to find as many voices as possible that then get translated what the key things are, rather than individual experiences. I think it's good enough to be seen at kind of group, population, community level, not just individual points or experiences. And I think, I think parents and within school sometimes, yeah, that's, that school lunch break is seen as a break in the, in the school day when in fact it isn't really. It should still be, and that's we've, we've, we've written about that because there is so much opportunity there and it can't all be done. I mean, I know um, school caterers get quite annoyed with me sometimes because it sounds like I'm saying that they need to do a lot more and actually they can't do everything and they're constrained. And actually it might be that we do have to bring in other stakeholders. I mean, when we were doing the work in Scotland, I kept saying, I mean, I was talking to somebody that ran one of the local shops, and she was saying, we've got all these great fruit producers around here. We'd love to get them into the schools to talk to the children about all the different things you can do with raspberries and get them doing lots of tastings. And they really wanted to work with the school, but actually, and I tried to facilitate that for them, was really difficult. But I think actually it would help the schools. You're getting external people coming in. They don't have to do everything about making these changes. Because what's really the case with that, though? The Olympic chefs in the school were saying, Per day, her pupil yeah. wants to be served. Yeah. Get, get her to community school, they're serving oats, a crumble of salmon, yeah. and hers on the table for eight pounds twenty five a week. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah, no, I think it's impressive. Yeah, thank you. being boards and they have all these other frameworks that are in place and depending on what their priority areas are within um, their public health strategy that that's where I think the power can be and that we can really make a difference because we can work with them as partners and then they can feed that back up into the circles that they're dealing with.
we did that research, the levy hadn't come in, so we didn't talk about that specifically, but we did ask young people, when we got the research, we went back to talk to the young people about our findings and sort of just get some feedback on some of them, just to talk to them then. And actually what they, we talked to them about what, what would happen if there were no policies on obesity, for example, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And actually they did think that, we, that policies were important because actually it shows that the, the government um, are, are thinking about what needs to be done and that they are taking charge of what needs to be done and that they are trying to set, give out the right messages about what will be done. But they were very aware that actually it doesn't mean we're going to, we or our families, know how to work with those policies or whether they make a difference to me and my family at local level. So they, they had quite sort of sophisticated understanding of policy and what it was there for and that it definitely had a purpose, even if they didn't feel that they needed to pay attention to it at the time. So I don't know how they're drawing that gap, I don't know. But ways of sort of contextualising and putting it into that broader socioeconomic context of everything that's written, so that no matter who accesses the document and the policy, they can see that it's not using sort of individual language. And I know that is only one part of the policy, but if somebody only reads one part and it's using that kind of language, then, that, then I think it can be quite damaging. And I think, and I'm very happy to follow up and talk to you more, because I think there are ways that we can show that Department of Health, government, whoever might be seen or perceived as, being, as writing these documents, understand that actually it's not a matter of just downloading an app and saying, oh, okay, we won't buy that cereal today because it's got too much sugar in, that, that there's a broader context, context within that sit, or within which that sits. And I, I think that is achievable without making the document six times longer than they said it needs to be. And again, I think we need to draw on the lived experience and have people involved in helping to write and shape those, those kinds of documents. Yeah, at the beginning, yeah. yeah. It's quite, uh, and I don't think it was that they were averse to thinking about it, and they thought they were thinking about it, but then the more they, they sort of read sort of sociological and, and other literature, then they realised that actually they'd only been, really been tinkering around the edges. And I think the other complication is, is that, and we've had this several times now with healthcare professionals, who are used to taking, you know, say, uh, a diet history or a record from a patient, which is very different to really talking to somebody and really understanding all elements of their life to then see how the food fits into it. And actually that's quite, that's quite hard cycle for, for healthcare professionals to break, we've, we've found. They do it, I mean, and they really gain from doing it and thinking, and we're always trying to say, you know, don't, don't assume that because someone's told you I don't have any cooking facilities, don't assume that's a bad thing. Or don't jump in with a value judgment, which again is really easy to do, especially when they're used to having a very tight clinic setting in practice where you know, you've got half an hour and they've got to ask all these questions as a dietitian. Whereas when you're a, a social researcher or a PhD student, they're trying to broaden that understanding. And we've had people, for example, um, look at uh, the role of diet in hypertension management. Um, and again, it's about seeing not the, what the patient does as wrong and the doctor's advice as right but really trying to think through, you know, the doctor has his own lived or her own lived experience 
the patients doing what they're doing for these reasons that you now need to go and find out about and really you know understanding it from a different from a social constructivist perspective but uh, and it's great when it works because I think they go back into practice afterwards if that's what they do with a completely different outlook of really how to understand the, pa the patient groups that they're working with. Yeah, yeah, that could be arranged. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I mean, for example, we've been working with, because um, I'm based in a research centre, so we don't have that much to do directly with undergraduates, but we've been working with the student dietitians and nutrition students when it was Malnutrition Awareness Week. We just had a, a, a thank you event with them yesterday for all the screening of older people that they did, and, and just hearing their perspective on it and being involved, you know, talking to these people out in the community and realizing that things were not as straightforward as they thought. Even things like involving students in those events, I think was hugely valuable for getting them to see the work we do and their practice in a different way. schemes like that there are uh, yeah there are and they're run I mean we've got some some great schemes I have to say in Hertfordshire where I work that are run by people again who I love working with because they've they've really thought about you know they uh, there's one person that I know who you know 10 years ago talked about behavior change and you know fairly straightforward way now he, his understanding of it now is so enriched by all the experiences he's really had with all the families they've worked with with it's through this family weight management services what it started out of, that he, I, I see him as a kind of, you know, inspirational figure and the way that he really tries to inspire his staff that we're really going to work with these families in a much more informed and involved way rather than just telling them what they need to do, which is how it started out, I have to say. But so there, there are schemes like that available, but of course it's very localised and they're not always easy to, you know, scale up and, and probably shouldn't. I could talk to you separately, but you know, but again, they are very individual type schemes, so, but yeah. We're coming to time now, so we've got a couple more questions left, if people can think of some hands, and hey, I'll just remember who's going to be on that question. Um, you mentioned earlier that you were inspired in a certain group where you could be involved in a community in the program, so I'd love to hear from yourself, how would you see the Facebook barrier? In community? Um, I think it's about using people that are already community champions of one kind or another, whether it's, I mean, again, thinking about around where I work, um, there are groups that work with local families already who allow us to go and talk to families through them in a way that makes sense to those families. You know, there's a lot of um, troubling issues that are going on in particular groups, so I don't think it's um, acceptable that we you know, might plough in and say, wouldn't it be great if we hold a scheme where we're going to teach all your kids to cook healthily and they're going to bring all the recipes home and do things, isn't that going to be wonderful? You know, but I think it's about having those local partners who know who you can work with. Um, I think the more that you do that and the more that you find the right people to work with, then it's much easier to find good ways of working with particular groups that are meaningful for everybody involved and that can be joined up.
Okay. Uh, well, let me try and give you a more concrete example. For example, um, there was a, a scheme, well, it's still running locally, that was aimed at obese men. Um, that men, and we were asked to evaluate it, um, do a qualitative evaluation. And I, I was absolutely amazed at how much all the participants could not wait to tell us how brilliant they thought this intervention was. I mean, more than anything else I've ever evaluated, they really wanted to get the word out there that this scheme works. And I told them all the barriers that I thought were going to happen to do with the scheme, you know, growing or being paid for again through or subsidised through public health. But they were so adamant that people had to know about it, that they really, we came together as a group to sort of think about the different ways that they could mobilise that kind of enthusiasm for it. And they came up with ways of sort of um, contacting the Director of Public Health, contacting their local MP. They all agreed who was going to write what. They all agreed those of us, there were some particular men in the group who had real sort of business skills, but some of the men absolutely didn't have that kind of, and they didn't know what language to use in writing. So then they decided who was going to do what, and we sort of helped facilitate that a bit, make sure things were passed on to the right people. And it, it had a really powerful effect because local public health authorities sort of did commission it again. We looked at whether it could be expanded to families, not just men, and we tried to really look at the elements that worked. Um, and from that, they've now developed, um, it's, it's aimed at young people in schools, so they're just piloting that at the moment to see whether. So I think it's, you know, if there's if there's one scheme, and similarly the example I was, thinking about, I was talking to you, which is this um, organization that works with local families that are really struggling when they've got young children, uh, for, for any kind of reason that work with them. And through them, you know, we've looked at different schemes that they could develop that will have impact, that could get funded by public health. And I think it's, it's feeding up and feeding back and working with. And I think it does depend on what's already available locally as to what you can tap into, rather than starting from scratch. Okay, I'm just going to have a minute for there. Um, I'd really like to thank you for a fascinating uh, conversation. Um, Good, thank you very much.